This is An Uncanny Hour. And this is a special anthology edition of An Uncanny Hour because we've got to the end of our first series. We've created six documentaries about some of my favourite weird, eerie and uncanny works of art. Sometimes movies, sometimes plays, sometimes music. And we've talked about them with people like Alan Moore and Stuart Lee and Charlie Higson and Kayla Janice. In that first series, we've looked at David Cronenberg's The Brood, we've looked at the 1970s cannibal classic Deathline, we've looked at Hawkwind and the counterculture of the 1970s, looked at the play Pender's Fen, and well, actually, we'll start off with the very first episode we made. Probably my favourite anthology movie of all time. It's nearly 80 years old, and it remains a deeply unsettling piece of work. It is the Ealing classic of 1945, Dead of Night. Just room for one inside, sir. I think the greatest horror anthology of the 21st century so far is Ghost Stories, and we spoke to its co creator and star, Andy Nyman, about Dead of Night. I can't pinpoint the first time I saw Dead of Night. All I can remember is being shaken by it in a way very 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 few films or even telly things have ever really done that there's a tiny number of them and um, and it's ageless i think as a film i mean it's definitely period in places um but there's something especially now in the middle of this weird pandemic there's something so isolating about it as a film and the experiences of all those people um it's a really amazing piece of writing and directing from everybody involved and i wonder if part of the power of it is accidental i, I wonder if now you know when they'd made it they didn't quite realize how amazing it was I was fortunate enough to screen Dead of Night one evening at the beautiful Phoenix Cinema in Finchley. And the person who accompanied me to that was Inside Number Nine's Rhys Shearsmith. This is is a, a real example of how they could do that proper horror of some of those. I mean, the final story, everyone cites it, of course, with the Ventura Chris dummy, but it really is really frightening. And then the, when it goes into the sequence that sort of encompasses all of the stories, that's a really nightmarish bit of film that the way that they put together that sequence of all those of the circular nature of it and it's a familiar thing now of course the sort of um the idea of, of a the, the circular and it's starting again but it's brilliantly done the way that he when he first when he first arrives at the house and he thinks this is I'm deja vu with this and then when it starts again at the end it's just perfectly done it's brilliant it's such a Oh wow, you feel so satisfied when you when you watch it and, and, and that's the conclusion. Someone that I always delight in meeting on the comedy circuit is Joanna Neary because she has a great love of classic British films and she spoke to us about her love of Dead of Night. As a child, and looking back I'm quite surprised that my dad played it to me, you know. But um, I think when you're little, you don't have a kind of idea that something's going to be funny or scary. You're just sort of open to what it's going to be. And because we watched so many black and white and films and England comedies, it was just another nice man going to a very nice house, some interesting people. And it wasn't really terrifying at that, that age. It wasn't until um, a bit older. I'd say I was probably about eight or nine when I first saw it. And it wasn't until we got into our teens that me and my sister developed a morbid fear of mirrors. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Which is, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it with your own child as well, which is what scares change. So, so there are things that as an adult or a teenager you find terrifying, which because as a kid you haven't necessarily developed a level of empathy, you don't care about certain levels of jeopardy. And the things that you do find terrifying are things that we would just brush aside. That's absolutely, I've never thought of that, yeah. For me, one of the scariest parts of the film is when the man says, um, that's it, your glasses. That's it, your glasses. What about my glasses? It's later on, we're having drinks. You break those glasses of yours, and then, quite suddenly, the room goes dark. And that was one of the scariest things as a child, because 
not being able to see is really basic and we both wear glasses so we know what that's like and actually it does happen to us i don't know how short-sighted you are but i'm pretty helpless without my glasses the next in our uncanny hour series was all about hawkwind inspired by joe banks's fantastic book hawkwind days of the underground radical escapism in the age of paranoia and the first person to talk to about radical escapism in the age of paranoia was someone who interviewed hawkwind in their heyday alan moore so I mean, I, I interviewed Hawkwind when I was with Sounds, and I, I went to see them once at the Rock in Wellingborough, and they were fantastic. Sadly, Stacia wasn't with them, but I think that they'd got um, Twink from right. the Pink Fairies, who was um, guesting on drums, and uh, he was on acid, I believe. And during a long drum solo under a strobe light, when everyone's attention was on somebody else, without missing a beat, he managed to take all of his clothes off. <laughs> so even though Stacia wasn't there, we did get to see some full frontal nudity. Stephen Morris from New Order remembers taking his mum and dad to go and see Hawkwind, which led to a morning of silence over the marmalade. Yeah, they kind of realised that I might possibly be going off the rails at, at, at that point. Um, because, I, yeah, I, I, I was getting quite obsessed with what used to be called the counterculture, which was kind of what led me into it. In, in 1971, even very young then, I became obsessed with the Oz trial and then into International Times, Michael Moorcock. I read a lot of Michael Moorcock, and it was, I suppose it was a Michael Moorcock connection, really, that um, drew me into Hawkwind, plus the fact that they weren't a lovey-dovey band. They sung songs about space and robots and, you know, the future and sonic attacks. And, you know, these were the things, this was a good lyrical content, I thought, rather than, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought this was what this is what songs by bands ought to be about. Singer, songwriter, and folkatronic hero Jane Weaver talked about the influence of Hawkwind on her. I kind of grew up between Liverpool and Manchester, so there was it was like a you know an industrial town. There was nothing, there's nothing for you in those places. There was quite a lot of live music, but you kind of have to root out those people who are a bit more free thinking, who you can connect with. And I did find them, and then you know it led to a more alternative lifestyle because when you grow up in, in a small town and not a city, you are kind of speaking for something a bit more interesting and it just sat really well with me you know that just the age that I was and it just all kind of linked together into that part of my life and I, I will you know and they've consistently they've always been you know from the beginning they've they've always been that that kind of thing you know where they they even though they were massively successful I think it's you know especially in the 70s it's like that they just ploughed on and they just, regardless of the the sort of music industry of it all, they were just their own unit and they just were able to just continue and continue. Whether that's now today, rock, I don't know, but, you know, but it's always been this kind of like huge, not unstoppable thing, you know, and it's totally admirable. It's like, yeah. Next up in the Uncanny Hour series was one of the most deeply disturbing films of my childhood, and I will now say also my adulthood, David Cronenberg's The Brood. Never before have you come this close to the edge of terror. Never before have you faced anything so strange and sinister, so bizarre and unnerving. Never until... Now, David Cronenberg's The Brood. Obviously, to understand David Cronenberg's The Brood, we needed to talk to a Freudian therapist. So we spoke to my friend, Josh Cohen. One of the things that I, I love about Cronenberg is that he gets us to think about emotions as bodily phenomena, not just mental phenomena. Um, there's some there are things that grow out of you that you feel at a bodily level and that manifest themselves all the time. I mean, you you get that in the fly um, as well. 
you know, there are, there are, there are, and, and even, you know, in the, in the Burroughs adaptation, um, that in a way what he's doing is really troubling the distinction between mind and body, because when the mind expresses itself, it doesn't express itself as this sort of pure organ of thought and words, but as a kind of, or it's really the mind is an organ of the body almost, you know, it's a kind of servant um, of, of the body. The, the, the mind is always doing the body's work and sort of trying to process what, what the body's feeling. Also, thanks to Kayla Janice, who you will hear from later on, author of the fantastic House of Psychotic Women, we were introduced to Cindy Hines, who played the part of Candy in The Brood. I, you know what, it's funny, I don't really have much memory of the first audition for The Brood. I remember more the second audition, because that's when I met David, and that's when I had to scream. And the scream was what got me the part. On top of being blonde and blue-eyed, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's so vague. Um, um, but I absolutely distinctly remember the second audition, David asking me to scream, me being afraid to scream too loud in the room. And he said, is that all you can do? And I'm like, well, no. And he's like, no, no, I, I want to see what you can do. So I, I let loose and there you go. <laughs> Amongst the other people we spoke to was Steve Bissett, who I first got to know through his work with Alan Moore on Swamp Thing, but has now written an enormous book on The Brood for the Midnight Movie Monograph series. For our fourth episode, we looked at a BBC play for today from 1974, which has had a whole new life in the 21st century. I spoke to Stuart Lee about Pender's Fen. The definition of what folk horror is has expanded all the time to include things like that scarf book, that funny scarf folk book and all sorts of stuff and probably even detectorists and all kinds of things. Um, but, um, but yeah, but, but Pendus Fen is primarily, to me, it would seem political. The, uh, this really great new book that's come out about it, of Mud and Flame of Essays about it, makes that point explicitly. And also it, it seems much more easily understood as politics now than I reckon it would have done when it came out. And I, this morning, I was listening to Lawrence Fox being um, interviewed on LBC. Um, he set up, um, he's setting up a political party, which is directly analogous to the one that, um, that, 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 that those mysterious, this mysterious couple in Pender's Fen set up. It has a kind of abstract disgruntledness about the loss of a mythical Britain. Um, the, the, uh, the boy in uh, Pender's Fen is, is basically... Uh, making a choice in his teens where he, he could become a sort of a Nigel Farage figure or a rubbish Nigel Farage, Lawrence Fox sort of figure if he's seduced by this sort of um, this sort of nostalgia. Uh, he turns away from that. Elgar, ridiculously, has been a deliberately politicised football in the culture war in the last two months. Elgar, you know, the, the um, right told all these lies about how the BBC were going to ban the words from... Um, from uh, Land of Hope and Glory, and um, the ensuing debate um, helped to position them and the Tories as sort of defenders of British identity uh, in the face of what actually turned out to be a, a, a load of spurious information about the idea that the BBC were going to take the words out of Elgar. Elgar himself was not entirely comfortable with the words to um, to uh, Land of Hope and Glory. They were written by uh, E.H. Benson, a horror writer. Um, and there were a sort of add-on, and um, there's a diary entry that purports to reflect after the First World War Elgar's discomfort at how the um, the words for um, Land of Hope and Glory had made it a a political, uh, patriotic, jingoistic piece. Unfortunately, the uh, head of the Elgar Society was telling me recently we're not able to check that diary entry because um, David Mellor had it moved from the Elgar Society to, I think, the British Library, and doesn't, no one seems to know where it is now. But um, so all all of those things are really, really relevant, and um, uh, it's you know it, it's it's tr it's trying to say things about national identity and to make the case that national identity is complicated. 
um, and that the, uh, the, the, the the pagan king is part of a national identity that doesn't necessarily sit alongside comfortably with the national identity that those characters on the far right would like to see uh, become the accepted national identity. If Rudkin was writing it now, um, doubtless it would it would take on board um, more issues about multiculturalism. Um, so yeah, it does seem um, it does seem re really much more relevant now. And it's it's a cliche to talk about science fiction and fantasy writers as being prophets and visionaries, but you know, Rud Rudkin uh, really um, ha has predicted there a lot of the debates that we're having now in, in, in their most feral and exaggerated form. You have to come with us. You are our child of light. You have to be born in us. Then you become pure light. No. No! Oh. <gasps> I am nothing pure. Nothing pure. My race is mixed. My sex is mixed. I am woman and man. Light with darkness. Mixed. Mixed. I am nothing special, no nothing pure. I am mud and flame. We also spoke to Professor Caroline Larrington, who, amongst other things, is the author of The Land of the Green Man. I thought it was very interesting the way that he's not set up to be a sympathetic hero at all in the the kind of political context. that He is a, a priggish, right-wing, um, nationalist, patriot, um, unthinkingly buying into the values of his grammar school, if you like. You see how the headmaster is really kind of inculcating this kind of um, traditional grammar school sort of uh, ethos. And then you see how that begins to unravel through bits of his subconscious coming up in, in the kind of dream forms and in the, uh, the apparitions, the angel, the demon, and his growing understanding of his own sexuality. And uh, importantly, too, quite often after that, he stops speechifying and he starts listening to people. And I think particularly, I never quite know how much he listens to what his mother says, but his mother, mother does have wise things to say. But he does listen to Mrs. On. And I think that's kind of useful for him that he's relating to somebody who isn't his mother, who isn't the figure who's coming in saying, you've got to turn that down, your father's trying to write a sermon, or come on, Stephen, you've got to buckle down and do your exams, or you went, end up working in a car factory. But you can have these larger, more general conversations with Mrs. Arne, and that takes him quite a long way along that, that journey. For episode five of An Uncanny Hour, we dealt with my favourite cannibal horror movie of all time. It is a horror movie with so many different ideas in it, with some beautifully realised performances, with a dark and witty script, and one of the most incredible tracking shots, that not merely in horror films, but in cinema. Uh, it's a tracking shot also that was uh, witnessed by Roger Moore, but you'll find out more about that uh, when you actually hear the full-length episode. But first of all, one of the people we were lucky to speak to was the director, Gary Sherman. Well, I mean, I was very excited about how it went in England and in Europe, you know, and we had won some film festivals and stuff. Um, but then, you know, it got sold to AIP in the United States and they re completely recut it. They retitled it and called it Raw Meat. They they cut the tracking shot out of it because they, they thought it was too long to watch. They cut all of Donald's humor out. In fact, they redubbed Donald in some scenes because they didn't think that the American audience could understand his his British accent. Um and they made a mess of the film, and it, it's it's horrible. And it, the the whole thing was just, and we fought it, and and we we got fucked completely. Um, and uh, it, it was horrible. And then AIP puts this cut together, and did him. Samuel Arkoff came to London. He was staying at the at the Savoy, at the, like the presidential suite or whatever the royal suite at the savoy 
and calls me and invites me to come have a meeting with him. And he shows up at the door in this silk dressing gown with a big SZ and a cigar the size of a baseball bat. And he, you know, and he starts talking to me and he, you know, he says, I don't know why you want to make films with people like Jay Cantor and Alan Light Jr. They don't know one end of the camera from the other. They make shit and da 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 dump and, and I just looked at him and I said, you know what, Sam? It's nice meeting you, but you make shit. They make good movies. And I don't think I want to continue this conversation. And I walked out. And that just cooled me on the whole idea of making movies. And, and as you probably know, I didn't make another movie for eight years after Deathline. Um, I was very proud of Deathline. It meant a lot to me. I might have known you'd turn up. Just about time, I'd say. The chief superintendent doesn't approve of uh, extramural perversion. How does the minister feel about it? All this is unfortunate. Now, I mentioned earlier on that Dead of Night was a film that I screened at the wonderful Phoenix in Finchley, but that was only one half of the double bill. The second half of that double bill with Reese Shearsmith was Deathline, and we had such an incredible time watching that movie on the big screen. Both of us have seen it many times on television, but there was a palpable excitement when those opening credits started. And uh, here, here is Reese talking about Deathline. Was that the first time you'd seen it on the big screen? Yes, yeah, without a doubt, yeah. And it was it transformed it, didn't it? It was like this is it felt so modern and 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 the jump scares were really great, weren't they? They really worked. What I always find about it, you know the chances I've had to be able to screen a, a, a film that you think you've everyone must have seen. Oftentimes, you ask them at the beginning how many people actually haven't seen it, thinking there'd be two, and most of the people oftentimes have never seen it. I did that with Theatre of Blood, and was most of the audience hadn't seen it, so such a thrill to be with a set of people that, have, that are experiencing it for the first time in the way that you meant to as well on a screen. So yeah, it was really thrilling to watch it, wasn't it? It really worked really well, really funny and really gory and grisly and, and a proper horror. You know, it felt really fresh and, and all the things that you see now and it take for granted done oftentimes in that film for the first time. That's Helen. Well, that wasn't the name of the station then. Now, there used to be one at British Museum, but that closed down when London Transport brought up the small companies. Now, were they connected, um, Holborn and British Museum? I wouldn't be surprised. The psychogeography of Deathline is something else that is fascinating. There are elements of real history attached to it, and also the visions that we see of early 1970s London are disturbing, sometimes alienating, and sometimes alluring. Kayla Janice, author of House of Psychotic Women, told me more about that. You know, that this is like a thing that people in London actually believe or that somehow it's connected to like a real folk legend or a real story somewhere. And and that is really backed up well by the actual tube, his, the real tube history, you know. And Gary Sherman says like, he's like, well, I did research, but, I, you know, but I made everything up. But there's a lot of really interesting actual geographic connections and stuff that make the naming and placement of things in the film really interesting. Like the um, Russell Square location was that tube station is only used for the exterior of it. And the same designer did Aldwych Station, uh, which is where they actually shot the interiors. So all, all over London, there's all these like disused weird stations. And Aldwych Station, where they shot the interiors of Deathline, um, at the time of shooting Deathline, it was still a, it was still in use. So that's that station was still in use, but only on weekdays, I think. So it was like on, so it became like a popular place to shoot films because on the weekends you could use it and have actual trains and stuff for your filming. Um, and I think Gary Sherman said that he had to submit a false script, you know, a fake script for something called treason for sale in order to get access to Aldwych station because at the time London Transport didn't want any kind of violent movies or anything shot in the station. Now the London Transport people are all over Deathline. They love 
deadline. <laughs> they, you know, when I was doing my article, there was people from London Transport helping me, and they were like fans of deadline and stuff. So they've obviously come around to it because now it's like a historical document, you know, of the tube stations. And we ended the series talking about UFOs. Why do we believe aliens might be visiting us? And what does that mean as well? I was joined by someone who's worked in the past with Ken Campbell, one of the great seekers, and he is a seeker himself. Dallas Campbell. Um, my, I've always, for me, I've always been interested in, I like the kind of conspiratorial angle. I think for me, when I watch Close Encounters for the first time as a, as a sort of an eight-year-old, which is all about, this, which is all a big conspiracy narrative, this idea that the government has this knowledge. And and it's such a good film, Close Encounters, because it's almost presented like a documentary. There's very little dialogue in it. It's just stuff happens. Um, and that always had a big effect on me. And, and sometime in the early 90s, before Area 51 became sort of common knowledge, I bumped into this guy, Glenn Campbell. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And we used to drive out into the desert and we'd and, and and we'd heard of Area 51, so we used to drive out there and just kind of hang out. And, you know, those stories of, like, wow, secret bases in the desert and, you know, if you cross this line, you're definitely going to be shot. And all that has a an intrinsic appeal for the, you know, as an adventurer, there's something nice about all that kind of stuff. So that those particular narratives I've always really, I've always really enjoyed. The only thing these phrases have in common are five, six. I hope somebody's taken all this down. Yeah. What are we saying to each other? It seems they're trying to teach us a basic tonal vocabulary. It's the first day of school, fellas. <laughs> I was also joined by the author of They're Already Here, Sarah Scholes. So I have always been interested in the extraterrestrial life side of things ever since I was a tiny, tiny kid. Um, but I was coming at it more from the, uh, the study side, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence side, looking for radio broadcasts from civilizations far away or things like that, not thinking about whatever might be flying things here. Um, and I kind of just put, put UFOs on, on a, a, a fringe side of things that I wasn't really interested in. And then uh, things changed for me, like for a lot of people, I think in uh, late 2017, when the New York Times came out with this big article about uh, a UFO investigation program that the, the Pentagon was supposedly doing. And uh, I was working uh, as a freelancer for Wired Magazine at the time. And then they were just like, hey, do you want to look into this thing that the New York times it's talking about that the military is investigating ufos and see you know see if it's legit see what's up with it and uh yeah just in uh long story short ish uh i started talking to people who've been researching ufo topics for a lot longer than i have and found that like most of them weren't as fringe or as as much of conspiracy theorists as I thought that they would be. There were a lot of people coming at it from a lot of different angles, historical, um, documentarian things things like that that i could really identify with and it just got me thinking you know why are people so obsessed with this thing and why have they been so obsessed with it for 70 years or so so there were a few excerpts from our first series of an uncanny hour there they were six 60 minute documentaries about all of the things that you've heard about and we have uh, a new episode which will probably be up in a few days and they normally go up friday at midnight and the next episode is all about john carpenter's apocalypse trilogy and that includes samira ahmed Stuart lee reese shearsmith uh someone who first watched the thing while in a polar region a particle physicist explaining the nature of evil and anti Evil. we'll probably put a little snippet of that at the end of this show also some of the guests by the way you didn't hear from the first series include jeremy dyson sarah morgan carrie thompson charlie higgs and Stacia blake and uh, hopefully we'll be hearing from them again in the new series as well this series is exclusive to the cosmic shambles network and you can subscribe at patreon.com forward slash cosmic shambles we do loads of other stuff every month as well there's normally 15 to 20 hours of stuff including the reality talk series our new series tips for existence which are a series of interviews Views with people about finding purpose and meaning in what appears to be a meaningless and purposeless universe and that includes guests such as Tim Minchin and Neil Gaiman and Nicole Stott and Andrean and anyway there's loads of people go and find out more about that also Book Shambles with Josie Long and our Sunday Science Q&A with Helen Chersky hope you'll join us and we'll see you back here soon and now here's just a little taster of Stuart Lee talking about the work of John Carpenter. We went to see John Carpenter live um, playing his music at 
the Shepherd's Bush Empire, which was fantastic. And we found ourselves sitting behind Matt Holness, the horror film director, which was just sort of worth it. You know, it was great. I went, we went with my wife as well, and it was a fantastic, uh, like, rock show as well, because back projected are all these horrific images of things being torn apart, like you would have got the butthole surfers in our day. So it was brilliant. But um, yeah, the music's Morricone, but it's like he's it's like he stripped everything out, so it does sound like that strange raw electronica minimalism of um, of of uh, John Carpenter. So it's I, I almost imagined that he, Morricone had tried to um, try to ape John Carpenter, but actually, what you're telling me is he just discarded everything. Yeah, <laughs> sound like, but this was this was Carpenter's first major studio commission, wasn't it? Yeah. So maybe maybe they wanted him to, uh, I don't know, and a, probably a film buff would know, maybe they wanted him to use Morricone because it felt like a safe pair of hands. They couldn't have just John Carpenter doing it on a Casio organ, which is what the rest of them sound like, how brilliant they are. But then, of course, what he did with the Morricone soundtrack was he got what he wanted out of it anyway. I remember the goth band Blood and Roses covered Assault and Precinct 13 on their John Peel session. In 1982, so it worked really well for it. I mean, the music's interesting if we're going to talk about that because sometimes it's almost banal, and and in uh, and yet it really is effective. In Prince of Darkness, it appears to be just the same piece, gradually building and building in intensity throughout the throughout the film. I may be wrong, but it never seems to sort of sort of let up until you're kind of crushed by it at the end. Whereas the music he co-wrote with someone else for In the Mouth of Madness is sort of like a heavy metal like sort of uh freak out really it's a kind of weirdly like heavy pop metal kind of thing that brackets the film on either side that that was very exciting live because him and uh that and uh ray davis's son who's his godson who was on guitar who is in his band they really got to wig out on that one it was great <laughs> 